But I'd like to get your response to some poems. Because I'm doing a book now of poems I've been working on three, four years, and I've got to turn it in in a month or so. And I'm, I'm trying to decide on two titles. One is, um, one is Morning Poems, which is correct, since I've been writing them in the morning. But uh, another possible title is um, the title of one of the poems, The Resemblance Between Your Life and a Dog. <laughs> so I don't know how to say that, but there comes a certain point uh, when you're my age or so, when you can look back and you see, my God, this looks like I have a life. You know, did I plan this? <laughs> Are you kidding? And Bill Stafford has a fantastic poem which says, uh, Sometime when the river is ice, ask me what mistakes I've made. Notice how carefully he did the sometime when the river is ice. <laughs> you know, don't get too close. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me what mistakes I've made. Ask me if what I've done is my life. That's one thing that started me thinking about this question of what is our life? What was all this? So here's the poem called The, Resem the Resemblance Between Your Life and a Dog. And all of these poems are still flowing along, and I'm not sure whether I should have the sparrow stanza in here or not, but this is the way it goes. I never intended to have this life, believe me. It just happened. You know how dogs turn up at a farm and they wag but can't explain. <laughs> That's my best stanza. There. <laughs> it's good if you can accept your life. You'll notice that your face has become deranged trying to adjust to it. Your face thought your life would look like your bedroom mirror when you were 10. That was a clear river touched by mountain wind. But even your parents can't believe how much you've changed. Sparrows in winter, if you've ever held one, all feathers burst out of your hand with a fiery glee. You see them later in hedges. Teachers praise you, but you can't quite get back to the winter sparrow. Your life is a dog. He's been hungry for miles, doesn't particularly like you but gives up and comes in. <laughs> I sort of lose the subject a little bit with the sparrow stanza. What do you think, John? Uh, I think it's very good because you come back to it and yeah. you know, circle back around, pick it up again. There's something about the tremendous energy of a young bird. Fluttering in your hand. It's like they got no life. They just got everything. In. Anyway, so very anyone good. have any thoughts about that? Yes, please. A sparrow seems to me that uh, it's the 10 year old face of the year. You're right. Uh, that's right. With all the energy. And that's I, right. I think that if that's, you know, there's something about the explosion of that loss there that really amplifies oh, your, good. your face in the mirror. Thank you. And I think we'd miss if it was going And I, I, I didn't intend that, but I noticed that it was happening. Yeah. And then I said, teachers praise you. Some teachers try to get you to go back to that moment when you were really a sparrow. But they can't quite do it. There have been too many dogs in the meantime. Yeah. But you can't quite get back to the window of Sparrow. Your life is a dog. He's been hungry for miles. Doesn't particularly like you. <laughs> <laughs> and women say, you know, if you're going to have a dog like, like that, I don't want to have you, you know. <laughs> so there's a lot of punishment for having a life. <laughs> 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 but the last line is great. Is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's one called The Exploits of the Wind, and it isn't quite the right title, but I learned this from Bill Stafford, that you want to say something, you know, don't just say, I'm a lonely person or something. I mean, we already know that. Um, but talk about, uh, you know, I've been thinking about fog, he'll say, or uh, I was thinking about this storm, which was running along trying to persuade the ground. <laughs> and you start out there somewhere and see how close it comes in. And he often talks about the wind, so I decide to do this one on the wind. It's called the exploits of the wind, and exploits isn't quite right. But sometimes there's a wind. Sometimes the wind takes a certain scrap of paper and blows it back into the Bible. And then your family line is whole and your great-grandparents stretch out in the coffin and rest. That's something wind can do. 
Sometimes the wind blows a skirt up a few inches and the body signs a contract for its novel. <laughs> then babies come and people sit at breakfast and the old words get spoken. Or the wind blows an ash into the anarchist's eye and he pulls the trigger too soon and he kills the king instead of the fat factory owner. And then a lot of men get on motorcycles and they dig trenches and the wind blows the gas here and there. And you and I get nothing out of that wind except blind uncles and a boy at the table who can't say please. Is that clear who that boy is at the end? That's like the sibling society when you can't give honor to anybody. And you know, you have to look at the possibility that that, that happened partially because we had so many stupid wars. Who could possibly? I mean, that's not the only reason, but. Sometimes there's a wind. Sometimes the wind takes a certain scrap of paper. I was thinking of uh, Etheridge Knight when I did this, that magnificent poem he has about being in prison. He's got the portraits of all of his children up there on the wall. And he says, uh, my grandmother keeps the dresses of all the men and there's no place in her Bible for whereabouts unknown. Sometimes there's a wind. Sometimes the wind takes a certain scrap of paper and blows it back into the Bible. And then your family line is whole and your great grandparents stretch out in the coffin and rest. That's something wind can do. Sometimes wind blows a skirt up a few inches. Only. I don't know if I should have only or not. Sometimes, is it? Sometimes wind blows a skirt up a few inches only. And the body signs a contract for its novel. And the body, and you don't sign the contract, the body does. Body noticed more in that, in that thigh than you did. <laughs> you notice after only a day here uh, how interested we are in those two inches. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't run away. Uh, then babies come and people sit at breakfast and the old words get spoken. Mm, that's lovely. And you could end it right there, but it wouldn't be true to our life. Or the wind blows an ash into the anarchist's eye and he pulls the trigger too soon and he kills the king instead of the fat factory owner. And then a lot of men get on motorcycles. I want you to see Germans, but one usually does see Germans. They dig trenches. I want you to get to the First World War. Yeah. Trenches. They dig trenches and the wind blows the gas here and there. And you and I get nothing out of that wind except blind, I got cousins, but uncles would be better except blind uncles and a boy at the table who can't say please. It's very good. It's a little naked, a boy at the table. But if I say, originally I had an, an, a nephew and a nephew at the table who can't say please. And then uh, my wife, because women are always very aware of family, she said, well, you know, your nephews might get a little offended by that. <laughs> <laughs> No, it never occurred to me as my fucking nephew, but um, but she was right in a way. Why cause trouble? Uh, what are you thinking, boy? Why did you choose please instead of thank you? Well, it's about taken, yeah. But thank you would be fine too. Usually those things are settled just by sound, you know, when you come down to it. I'm not totally satisfied with the last line. Okay. You and I get nothing out of that wind except blind uh, uncles and a boy at the table who can't say the word please, who can't say please, who can't say. Okay, good. John, let's have a couple of points. What you want? I don't know. <clears throat> this is called uh, locking yourself out and trying to get back in by a gentleman who died a few years ago, Raymond Carver. Wow. This is a long keeping with uh, trying to get back into your life and wondering how you ever got out of it, you know. You simply go out and shut the door without thinking. And when you look back at what you've done, it's too late. If this sounds like the story of a life, okay. 
It was raining. The neighbors who had a key were away. I tried and tried the lower windows, stared inside at the sofa and the plants and the table and the chairs and the stereo setup. My coffee cup and ashtray waited for me on the glass top table, and my heart went out to them. <laughs> I said, hello, friends, <laughs> or something like that. After all, this wasn't so bad. Worst things had happened. This was even a little funny. I found the ladder, took that, and leaned it against the house, then climbed in the rain to the deck, swung myself over the railing, and tried the door, which was locked, of course. <laughs> but I looked in just the same at my desk and papers and my chair. This was the window on the other side of the desk where I'd raise my eyes and stare out when I sat at that desk. This is not like downstairs, I thought. This is something else. And it was something to look in that unseen from the deck, to be there inside and not be there. I don't even think I can talk about it. I brought my face close to the glass and imagined myself inside sitting at the desk, looking up from my work now and again, thinking about some other place, some other time, the people I had loved then. I stood there for a minute in the rain, considering myself to be the luckiest of men, even though a wave of grief passed through me, even though I felt violently ashamed of the injury I'd done back then. I bashed that beautiful window and stepped back in. Isn't that beautiful? That ending is so surprising. You know, it's moving along there. And, and uh, I bashed that beautiful window and stepped back in. What does that mean? He got back into his life somehow, if only for a moment, you know. But it took that anger. He was being so passive about it and just like an observer of his former life. And then finally he had to take that window and break it, step back in. You like that? And this one has kind of got some, uh, this is from Robert's uh, Time Alone by Machado, his translation. If I were a poet of love, I would make a poem for, you, for your eyes as clear as the transparent water in the marble pool. And in my water poem, this is what I would say. I know your eyes do not answer mine. They look and do not question when they look. Your clear eyes, your eyes have the calm and good light, the good light of the blossoming world that I saw one day from the arms of my mother. And then again, uh, I always loved that poem because Machado had a wonderful <coughs> relationship with his mother and his father. And he says at one point that uh, he was living in Seville or something and the dolphins came up that year about 15 miles up the river. And he said, my parents, like others, went down to the riverbank there in Seville to watch the dolphins. And he said, I did too. I was in the womb, you know, but I saw it. <laughs> and, and that's probably true. But it meant it was a very quiet womb, wasn't it? And there was something unbelievably quiet and good about Machado's childhood. And, uh, and that gives him that solidity that none of the rest of us have. And, uh, and uh, there's something here that John was talking about this morning, how we always demand something from a woman. You know, you got some part of me, I want it back. Right? And here he says, what does he say? Your eyes mm -hmm. look at me and they don't particularly answer me, they mm -hmm. just look. Let's do it once more, John. If I were a poet of love, I would make a poem for your eyes as clear and as transparent as the, as the transparent water in the marble pool. And in my water poem, this is what I would say. I know your eyes do not answer mine. They look and do not question when they look. Your clear eyes, your eyes have the calm and good light, the good light of the blossoming world that I saw one day from the arms of my mother. 
It's a heartbreaking poem. Mm -hmm. That's why I chose Because we don't see clear water, we see turmoil water. Murky water. Because our mothers were not clear at the time we were there. And this woman that he sees really is the world, isn't it? The blossoming world. But it's just amazing. I mean, there are people who, whose mothers were so calm and, and, and gentle that uh, it made the whole world seem wonderful when the mother was holding the boy. And he can still feel it. Well, do you remember, Machado only says, if I were a poet of love. Well, I think that's cute because most poets say, I am a poet of love. Now, we do, do a really bad poem that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a little disclaimer in that, you know? Uh, what do you mean, disclaimer? Well, it's like, like you know, if, if that were my life, you know, if I did have all that, oh, I see. then I could write this poem. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it's, it's also the possibility that the only people that are poets of love are the disturbed ones. And of course, he was always saying, you know, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm not very bright and everything like that. And Well, he was and, also, you know, like, I, I just read this short one here. Yeah. The, the house I love so much. She lived there, rising above a great mound of bricks and chunks, broken down and collapsed, shows now, shows now its black and worm-eaten, badly lasting skeleton of wood. The moon is pouring down her clear light in dreams that turn the windows silver. Poorly dressed and sad, I go walking along the old street. So there's a sense of both there that you know, this is a very complex man who is able to say, my, my mother was this beautiful, warm, clear-eyed woman. And then I still end up walking lonely yeah. down the streets in a ragged old coat. But what's brilliant about that is something that uh, Dylan Thomas could never have said. Right. You know, he said, here I am, I'm all excited, I'm great, give me a drink. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> you do him so well. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes right. a lot of guts to write a line like, poorly dressed sure. and sad. I go walking down the street. street. Poorly dressed <laughs> and sad. 